Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Cadet Second Class Justin Yates. Welcome to the 28th Annual National Character and Leadership Symposium. It is my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, Joanne S. Bass. Chief Master Sergeant Joanne Bass represents the highest enlisted level of leadership in the United States Air Force. As Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, she serves as a personal advisor to the Chief of Staff and Secretary of the Air Force on issues regarding the welfare, readiness, morale, and proper utilization and progress of over 600,000 total force airmen. By being selected on June 19th to become the Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, Chief Bass became the first woman and Asian American in history to serve as the highest ranking non-commissioned member of a U.S. military service. Prior to becoming the 19th Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, Chief Bass served in a variety of leadership positions across the squadron, group, wing, and MAGCOM levels. Chief Bass has also participated in several operations, both in the United States and overseas, as well as deploying in support of operations Southern Watch, Enduring Freedom, and Iraqi Freedom. She has served in the Air Force for over 27 years and has accumulated significant special operations and joint experience. Chief Bass is a proven leader of character with a plethora of experience to share with all of those attending. Senior Master Sergeant Katie Garcia, Superintendent of the United States Air Force Academy's Center for Character and Leadership Development, will be leading us through a fireside chat with Chief Bass this afternoon. We'll now begin the moderated portion of our panel, which will be followed by an open question and answer time. Audience, we ask that as you listen to our moderated discussion, you ask questions for our panelists using the Zoom Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. As the Q&A moderator, I will review your questions and share them with our panelists at the end of our session. Senior Master Sergeant Garcia, I now hand it over to you. Thank you, Cadet Yates. And ma'am, it's wonderful to see you again and have you here with us today for the National Character and Leadership Symposium. Um, I know that there's a lot of viewers out there really interested to hear what you have to say, so I'm going to get right into it. Uh, as you know, our theme this year is warrior ethos as airmen and citizens. When we define warrior ethos, we use terms like tough-mindedness, warrior spirit, tireless motivation, and unceasing vigilance. How do you define warrior ethos, or how does that concept resonate with you? All right, Senior Garcia, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Fantastic. So real quick, um, before we get to answering questions, first of all, I just want to um, say thanks to the Academy for allowing me an opportunity to come and spend some time with you guys. Um, two, I do have to tell you that um, it is such a small Air Force, and I love the fact that we serve um, in this capacity, that I have to give a shout out to a, now he's a Mr. Tom Ulmer, but he was my previous squadron commander <laughs> when I was at the 86 OSS. And, and when he found out that I was going to be coming here to speak to the cadets, he, he shared with me um, a couple words of advice, and that was, don't suck. So, <laughs> so all that to say, um, you know, um, I'm going to do my best not to, and we're just going to have a good time talking. And really, I want to hear what's on the minds of our cadets and, and have some good, meaningful dialogue. So back to your, um, answer, your question on... Um, warrior ethos and, and et cetera. Here, here's what I would share. When I think about warrior ethos, what does that mean to me? And, and what does it mean to, um, to serve in that capacity? What I would say is that um, it's understanding that you are part of bigger, you're part of something bigger than yourselves and that you are part of a profession of arms. Um, Knowing that we're in a profession of arms, there are things that are asked of us more than any other profession or career field that you can serve of in your life. You know, um, this is not working um, in industry outside of our military. You are part of a profession where you serve alongside your brothers and sisters. And if asked to give your life, we would do so. And so um, when I think of that warrior ethos, I think of a, a, a higher calling and one that um, we ask a whole lot of, again, our, 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 um, the brothers and sisters who serve with us, and, and it's an important aspect. Thank you, ma'am. Um, and so a lot of us, we have 
different perspectives, right, and worry ethos. Um, so hearing your input to that really, I'm sure, resonates with some of this and really helps us build what we think that means. I'd like to move on to my next question, ma'am. And um, in a previous interview with you, I asked you what role you thought NCOs and senior NCOs had in ensuring airmen are prepared for future conflict. And you spoke about how the Air Force needs to operate differently than it did 20 years ago, and that this environment is not a traditional uncontested environment. Considering your comments and your thoughts, does the evolving strategic environment change how you think about warrior ethos or how airmen may view themselves as warriors? I think it, it does for certain. You know, more, more is asked of us than, again, any other um, profession and, and more is expected for every single one of our NCOs. So certainly. So ma'am, I would follow up with that then ask, how do we help airmen who are in uh, roles that aren't maybe traditionally associated with being a warrior, how do we help them see themselves as warriors? I think understanding the bigger picture of the mission and understanding that um, every job, no matter what it is, all gets after um, our mission in the United States Air Force, which is to protect and defend our nation and our nation's interests. And so when you can connect yourself Whatever AFSC you are part of, if you can just connect yourself into that bigger mission and as leaders, as, as um, senior enlisted leaders, as NCOs, as soon to be CGOs for um, our lieutenants, um, we have to connect our airmen to that bigger, broader picture of that mission. Yes, ma'am. And I think it'll be interesting, right, how we do that coming in the years to come. Uh, the, another question that I wanted to get at, ma'am, was... Um, and one of the aspects of warrior ethos is demonstrating integrity as it relates to moral courage. Can you share an experience where you have, or you have witnessed another airman exhibit moral courage in the face of adversity? You know, I've been so privileged and, and, and one of the best parts of my job serving as the chief master in the Air Force is really to be able to talk with airmen, um, lots of airmen throughout our formations. And, and I see moral courage displayed throughout our Air Force. I will share just one example that happened recently when I was at an um, all call with a few hundred of, of our airmen. It's always a little bit awkward at first when I'm talking to a few hundred airmen as to who will answer the question first or who will ask a question first. And this particular um, time, you know, we, you know, it was time for us to have dialogue. And then a young lady stood up um, and asked the first question. And, and really what it was, it took a lot of courage for her to ask this because she was in a room full of, again, her, her fellow brothers and sisters and primarily um, male airmen. And she asked me, Chief, when is, when is the United States Air Force going to address sexual harassment um, in the formations. That, and I'll be honest, it kind of caught me off guard for her to ask that. But what I immediately thought of, man, that took a lot of courage for her to be able to stand up and ask a question like that, um, in, in which I had to pause for a minute. And my response was, well, since we're in a room with, with our brothers and sisters, I, I'd like to ask that to everybody in here and especially to um, some of our male airmen. What, what, what do you say to how, how do you think the Air Force should tackle um, sexual harassment in the military? And, and we waited for a little bit and it was kind of that awkward pause for a long, long while until finally a young airman first class male airman stood up and addressed that. And so, so two, two examples of moral courage in my mind. One, the female airman for asking that question in front of a few hundred of her peers and teammates. And then two, for that young A1C to stand up and say, Chief, the only way we're gonna be able to get after um, sexual harassment and get after the culture that we expect in our Air Force is um, if we get after the heart and, and it's a heart thing and, and we have to start to become those people of character that, that we're taught mm -hmm. to be. 
Thanks, ma'am. That's a, an awesome story. And the airmen never seem to surprise, right? There, there are some strong uh, individuals that really demonstrate moral courage. I would like to go back a little bit to the discussion of profession of arms. So in 2007, we know that the Air Force adopted the Airmen's Creed. Uh, at the time, the CSAF, uh, General Mosley commented, and I'm going to read his quote, we must never forget that our Air Force isn't just a conglomeration of diverse specialties, skill sets, or jobs. Ours is the profession of arms. So how does that resonate with you? Or how does being part of this profession really resonate with you? You know, I spoke about it a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we ask more of um, our profession. We ask more of our um, the men and women who serve in our military than any other professional than any other profession that there is. And when it comes to the profession of arms, it's not just a job; it is honestly a calling. Um, I would offer that a lot of people join our Air Force not necessarily feeling that way, and that's okay because I think it's just something that we all perhaps get at different times in our life. When I joined our Air Force almost 28 years ago, I'll be honest, I joined to get my GI Bill, serve four years and, and figure life out. At that time, I didn't join thinking that it was a profession of arms. I didn't think join thinking that it was a calling. Um, but 28 years later, I understand 100% how it really is. And, and, and I got there probably around the eight year mark of time and service. And I, I tell people that all the time, I didn't really join the Air Force until I had been serving for about eight years. And that's when I started to realize that, man, this really is a calling. After I had been serving for a little while, after I went on a few deployments, after I had the privilege to serve with some just great, rich Americans, um, who have such great character and competence, that's when I started to learn that this was way more than signing up for a GI Bill. Um, and it was, you know, and, and, and honestly, looking back at my 28 year career, the Air Force has given me, although it's a calling, it has given me so much more than I can ever probably give back. Well, thank you for your transparency, ma'am, because I think a lot of, I am in the same position, right? I don't think I really joined the Air Force till much later on. Um, and I think hearing it from somebody at your level is important for our airmen to hear that are watching as well. So I appreciate that. My next question, ma'am, has to do with the recent release of the airmen leadership qualities. Uh, you commented that this is part of building a system to define the qualities we value and need in our airmen. Uh, will you share your view on how the elements of warrior ethos intersect with these airmen leadership qualities? Yeah, I'm super excited that we have um, the airmen leadership qualities. There's 10 of them. And I think by outlining what they are helps our airmen understand what we it, in an Air Force value. And it also helps us to understand because they're really the mission. They're the four um, graded areas that we look at, you know, when we go and um, visit an installation. And that's, you know, executing mission, um, leading people, how do we manage our resources, and then how do we improve our unit? So if we know those four fundamental things, um, you can tie in who we are as, as warriors, who we are serving in this profession of arms with those things, how well we execute our mission, how well we lead people, um, how are we improving our unit, and how do we manage resources? I, I I will say that I'm also very glad that one of those qualities is now emotional intelligence. And, and that's something that we haven't always necessarily evaluated, um, at, at least in the sense that we are now. And I think that the, it's a important quality to have, especially where we are today and at, at this inflection point um, where, where we're honored to serve the, the, the the, the warrior ethos that maybe I joined 28 years ago is perhaps um, evolved a little bit more where, where we do need leaders to be able to have the qualities where they have emotional intelligence and know how to um, discipline their own emotions and also understand how their emotions impact others around them. Thank you, ma'am. I think that's uh, I don't know that I would have drawn all those connections, so I'm glad we had that chat. Um, and then, ma'am, I, I have another question that um, 
when I think about tough mindedness or I think about tireless motivation, I see a connection with resilience. I'm sure everybody here who's watching, right, or viewing can, ha, can remember a time where they've experienced failure. Yeah. Do you, uh, can you share a time with us perhaps where you experienced failure and then how you were able to nav navigate through that experience or situation? All the time. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I honestly don't think we have enough time in the day to, to go through it. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm a big proponent of failing forward that, you know, failing um, you know, it is, is actually learning. And, and if you're not learning from your failures, you know, um, then you never quite grow. And, you know, there's certainly lots of them and, and, and we don't have time for all my very good juicy failures <laughs> that I um, young airmen, but I'll share one when I was um, a group superintendent and I, and I was a chief um, I felt like I, of, of all the positions I've held as a chief master sergeant, um, probably group superintendent is one where I share with fellow chiefs, hey, like learn from me where I felt like, um, I, I don't know that I would deem it as like utter failure, but I learned from some things that I felt like I failed in that and that I got so consumed with everyday life in, in terms of work. I got so consumed in all the duties that I had to do that I really spent more time knocking out taskers, knocking out emails, knocking out all the day-to-day -day stuff that you do to take care of mission that I lost the art of pushing away from my desk and going out to connect with fellow airmen and, you know, and, and being a good wingman, being a good leader, that, that I spent, when I look back at my, uh, I think it was probably two years of being a group superintendent, I think, um, you know, I spent way too much time in my office thinking I was doing a good job, you know, taking care of that. But what I didn't do was connect well to airmen. And when I left in PCS from that job, um, I remember that vividly because as I reflected, you know, before I go to another job, I kind of reflect on what, 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 what things did I do well in this previous job, what things do I need to work on as I move forward to this next job? It really just stood out to me. I was behind the desk too much. I didn't spend enough time with the airmen where it matters and listening to them and, and, and maybe advocating um, better for them. And so I took that with me to my next job and in that, man, that'll never have, I never want to regret again. I never want to um, not be there for airmen and, and think that I spent too much kind of be behind the scenes. And so, um, I share that with, with fellow chiefs on, you know, you've got to um, be available to your wingman. You've got to be a good um, leader to the airmen that you're entrusted with, and you've got to be a good wingman to your boss. And, and that sometimes requires for you to get away from your desk and push away from the, the everyday tasks. Thank you, ma'am. I think uh, it's easy to get caught up in that. And so hearing that a it's, I think you have to remind yourself constantly, right? Ask yourself these questions. Uh, so we appreciate you sharing that with me. And before uh, I pass off to Cadet Yates so you can get the really tough questions, I have one final question for you, ma'am. Um, and that is, what would you? what is one thing that you'd want our future officers to know about the enlisted force? Man, I can't limit it to one. Let me try to though. Um, I, <laughs> I would offer that today's enlisted corps is extremely talented, extremely talented, extremely bright, very smart, and ready to get after the mission. They, they, they are part of the 1% who raise their hands to voluntarily serve in the United States Air Force. So be part of the team that is wanting to unleash that talent so that our Air Force can be its very best, you know, extremely talented airmen. They need to know that. I definitely agree, but I might be a little biased. Uh, <laughs> Ma'am, thank you for sharing your perspective on some tough yet very important topics. I will now hand it over to Cadet Yates, um, who's been monitoring audience questions. So Cadet Yates, over to you, sir. 
Thank you so much. Uh, Chief Bass, thank you so much for inspiring words today. Uh, we do have a lot of questions from the audience, so we'll get started with those. And to start off, as cadets at the Air Force Academy, one of the uh, most prevalent pieces of advice we get is to find a senior NCO at your first unit and latch on to them and kind of learn all their knowledge. So when I graduate from the academy, uh, hopefully coming up in a little bit over the year, and I find that senior NCO, what, what would I be looking for in that senior NCO? And then what would that senior NCO be teaching me as a very junior officer? Yeah. Um, you know, so the same thing, Cadet Yates, great question, and, and, and it's a pleasure to meet you. What I would offer is, you know, anytime you're looking to um, surround yourself by people, you, you look for people of character, you look for people of competence um, and you look for people who have experience. And, and that is where your senior NCOs or your NCOs can provide you a wealth of knowledge. They've been doing this for a while. And, and you know, we talk about, we are usually the sum of our uh, training, our education and our experiences. And really it's that experience that, that um, you're gonna need as a young Lieutenant and as a young, CGO. And if you can accompany all the training and the education that you've just received with somebody who has experience, that, that, that's where the goodness lies. Thank you so much, ma'am. That's great advice. And I think uh, we also get the uh, advice that you use those people to learn from their mistakes so you don't have to make those mistakes yourself. And I think that's also very valuable. Um, so one of our questions is, with uh, General Brown's accelerate change or lose message, uh, clearly valuing retention of exceptional airmen, how does the US Air Force plan on implementing new retention initiatives? And then the second part to this question was, will we see more workplace accommodations and flexibility? Hmm, great questions. Um, well, first of all, let me share real quick. The Air Force does not have a retention problem at all. In fact, we are about, I think, you know, 8,000 airmen over our end strength. Some of that is because, you know, we're coming, you know, out of a pandemic right now where, where a lot of people um, pulled paperwork to separate or retire out of the Air Force, um, probably in, in part to um, the security that they have in, in serving in the Air Force still. So we don't have a retention problem um, at all. Now where our focus is really how do we retain the right airmen? And so to that point, that's why we're very focused on, you know, people readiness and culture. How, how do we make the United States, States Air Force a, a place of choice where our airmen are excited to serve and they come to work um, excited to get after and get after their mission set? That's, that, that's a big culture piece. And, and every single one of our leaders, every single one of our airmen have a ability to impact the culture in their workplaces. I, I tell airmen uh, leaders all the time, most people don't quit their job, they quit their boss. And so we've got to create and develop leaders who, who are the leaders that, um, that airmen love to serve under and, and want to serve with and, and, are, and can reach their full potential. Yes, ma'am. And I'd love to elaborate on that. Um, with those leaders, um, what do you look for in a leader? Or what have you seen um, as the kind of core qualities of a good leader in future officers or future senior NCOs or even future mentors? Well, first off, Cadet Yates, let me tell you, I've had some amazing leaders that I've had the privilege to serve with. Being a one Charlie zero, I, I, I'm ops. I've been ops for um, all of my career. And with that, most of my supervisors have been commissioned officers. And, and you know, to include Colonel Almer, and, and I'll got, give him a shot out there, but what made somebody like him and the other um, leaders that I've served with and under so great, the transparency that they've had, the being genuine, acknowledging that um, perhaps maybe they don't know all of that, but they, they hire and they surround themselves with people who do have the skill sets that they want. Um, they are confident in the teams that they've built. They're confident in the mission and the vision that we're getting after as the United States Air Force. Um, and yet they're, again, transparent and authentic and humble enough to be able to um, reach out to 
other talented airmen to help accomplish the mission. That's great advice. And I know that our sooner graduating seniors will definitely take that to heart um, once they commission. Um, so kind of switching gears a little bit, we've gotten a lot of questions from the audience on the work-life balance. And so this question is, how do you manage your time, or should I say your tasks, effectively in your early 20s, balancing the different areas of life, such as relationship and purpose in your career? Well, considering I'm only 29, um, let me think, no, I'm playing. Um, so in the early 20s, it was a whole lot easier. I didn't, I didn't have kiddos. And so work-life balance was, was easy. You know, I worked and then, um, you know, had a good time with my fellow wingmen, just enjoying my best life ever. As I became a non-commissioned officer, um, got married to my army husband, and we started to have kids, life started to get a little tougher on that work-life balance. And, and I tell people all the time that it really is a balancing act. And, and you know, a, a lot of people would offer, you never quite balance it. It's more of a harmony. How do, how, how do you figure out what works for you? Uh, myself, my husband, our kiddos, it, it was an everyday process on trying to figure out how, how to balance being, um, you know, 110% at work, being 110% um, spouse, mom, dad, et cetera. Um, it takes work. It, it takes being deliberate about it. Um, but what you can't ever do when it comes to that work-life balance, I, I would offer is forsake yourself. I, I'm, I'm big on self-care because you can't pour from an empty vessel. You've got to take care of yourself. And if you take care of yourself, then you can probably be the best airman that you need to be, the best spouse and the best uh, mom or dad that you need to be by, by doing those things. And, and I share that after I've been serving for almost 28 years. As it, in my 20s, um, again, I, I, I didn't have a hard time work-life balance in my 30s. I very much did because I was at NCO and that senior NCO trying to juggle all those things around. And then, oh, by the way, I'm also a supervisor to airmen and they were relying on me as well. Um, and I would, and, and I had to learn from trial and error where I, I did not do due diligence by myself. Um, I, I would quit PTing because there wasn't enough hours in the day. I, I would kind of quit my professional development because I didn't have time to read or, or go to courses. I was just trying to manage. But as I continue to grow in experiences, realizing that does nothing for anybody, I, I've had to learn how to make sure that I take care of myself by, um, by, you know, making sure I get my PT on first thing in the morning, by pouring into myself in the morning, by listening to podcasts, by eating right, sleeping well. Um, and then of course, you know, I, um, setting boundaries on, on how much work that I do, get, being efficient at work, and then making sure I provide um, time to my family to take care of them. Yes, ma'am. That's a great perspective. And I know cadets specifically, we struggle a lot. I struggle a lot with work-life balance because we live, go to school, um, work and eat all within about five minutes of each other. So it gets hard kind of drawing those boundaries. So I think that's a, a great piece of advice. Um, but ma'am, you mentioned uh, podcasts and some professional development. So do you have any podcasts or books you'd recommend for the audience? I do. If you guys go to um, my uh, official Facebook site, you'll see on the cover there, I have listed out the things that I am reading and the podcasts that I'm looking at um, for this quarter. And I've decided not to do a um, once a year thing. And, and, I'm, and I'm kind of putting my reading list and podcast list out there every quarter because our world is very dynamic today. We, we you know, our, our threat changes. Um, and, and our focus changes, so I'll update that quarterly. But if I could offer one podcast, it would be um, Quick Quick Brain by Jim Quick. I love it because it's bite-sized brain hacks for busy people, and I'm like, that's me. I can only kind of chew off of about you know 15 minutes of podcast time, and I and I listen to one or two podcasts every single day while I'm getting ready, and and that kind of just fills me up from a. Uh, mental perspective and, and gets my mindset where it needs to be to focus on the day. 
Ma'am, you were, you were ready for that question. That's perfect. I'll definitely have to look that up as soon as this session's done. Um, so again, thank you so much. That's great advice. I'm going to transition a little bit um, for another question from our audience. And they said, Chief Bass, I'm researching mental health and suicide awareness in the Air Force and wanted to get your view on how the Air Force is doing in these fields. Yeah, um, we can improve in, in, in a big way when it comes to mental health, suicides, um, but more importantly, resiliency. I, I choose to focus on resiliency most because I feel like if we can get far left uh, before an airman starts to deal or family member, before they start to deal with mental health issues or and, and certainly before an airman ever thinks about suicide, if we can get way left of it, we're gonna be good at building, helping airmen to build their own resiliency skills. And so that's where I would like us to start to get better at by equipping our airmen with the tools that they need to build their resilience. I think that we have some solid, we have a solid foundation on our comprehensive airman fitness. I'm a big fan of our pillars, um, which are physical, spiritual, social, and mental. Um, I think that we have some work to do on making sure that every one of our leaders have the tools that they need to be the best wingmen that they need, that they can to be able to support our airmen through challenging times of their life. I, you know, I think at times that we've gotten accustomed to hitting the easy button where the easy button is, um, you know, I, I don't know that I have time to figure out what's going on in the lives of my airmen. So I will just refer them to the chaplains or, or mental health. And while that should be true, because we are certainly not professionals, what I've noticed and what I've learned and seen over the years is that a lot of airmen don't necessarily need that. They just need to know that somebody cares. Um, and so that's, you know, you know, I didn't bring that up as one of the qualities that I look for in a leader but that's absolutely one of them. I know I talk about transparency, authenticity, and, and, and being genuine, but, but that, care, that care and compassion is a huge character trait that every single one of our leaders expects. In fact, when I talk to most airmen, especially if I go to airman leadership school and I ask airmen, what's the one, care, what, what's the one thing you wish your NCOs or your CGOs knew um, or would do for you. And most of them will tell you, we just want to know that our leaders care. And so when we get to a point where, um, where leaders have, have, again, more tools in their toolkit to take care of their fellow airmen and their wingmen, and they care, I, I think we'll be in a better place when it comes to um, helping our airmen with, with, with the challenges they have on, on resiliency. Yes, ma'am. And I have a slight follow up on that. Where do you think the most effective level to really cultivate that culture of kind of caring for your subordinates or for your wingman comes from? Do you think that's more flight or squadron or even can that be accomplished at the wing level? Yeah, I, I personally think that the most impactful people in a member's career are the people that are immediately around them. The people that are in that section, the people that are in that flight that they spend their day to day with, um, people are not um, solely upset or people are not wanting to hurt themselves or, or, or get out the military or whatever necessarily because of the wing commander or the wing command team. Again, people get disappointed in the leadership that is immediately around them and, and that is the most critical leadership. So. You know, when I look back at my career on, on times where I um, seemed pretty strong uh, and, and, and had grit and had resiliency and, and was excited to come to work, it was because that core section that I, that I was part of um, was a, one that had a strong climate and culture of unity and camaraderie, and, and that was important. You know, so, so they're all important. But, but certainly that flight and that squadron and, and it, it, yeah, the flight and the squadron is probably what I would say. It's a heartbeat of our Air Force. 
Yes, ma'am. And I think we definitely see that at the Academy. And I have a great follow-up question by uh, Joseph Ruley. And um, they said, for the, all the dialogue for the Air Force about embracing diversity, affecting change, and eliminating bureaucracy, how do we make sure those efforts trickle down to the squadron level? It's upon every single squadron member, every airman, to decide to take into action um, what, their, what the call to action is, which is, um, you know, we've got to be, a, we, we are a diverse force, so we need to embrace the inclusiveness that we need so that every airman can thrive. Um, the, you know, how, how do we embrace the innovation that we've got to get after it to embrace the, the um, to accelerate the change that we have to get after? How do we get after all of our action orders a, B, C, and D, especially the bureaucracy piece, it's going to take action at every level. If we are magically waiting on um, headquarters Air Force and, and what we say on, hey, let's get after the bureaucracy piece to magically happen in your section or your flight or your squadron, it's just not going to happen. You know, it takes action at every individual level. And I think every one of us has an opportunity to help get after that culture that we want, that non-bureaucratic culture that we want. Um, if there are processes and policies that are keeping you from being able to be your best in your squadron, don't wait on headquarters Air Force to fix that or your wing to fix that. You know, you help identify ways that we can fix that and get, it, get after the bureaucracy piece. If your squadron or flight is not as inclusive of all people that it could be, that not all airmen have a voice um, or, or not all airmen are being treated equally. Every single one of us has an opportunity to help shape what our culture should look like. Thank you so much, ma'am. And I have another question from the audience from a tech sergeant Feenstra, and sorry if I mispronounced that. Um, but they asked, with distance learning, telework, virtual education, and PT changes, do you think COVID has made a lasting impact on the Air Force, or do you see the branch returning to operations similar to pre-COVID times? Yeah, I think that, um, so both. Yes, yes and no to both things. I think um, the pandemic has absolutely had a lasting impact um, on our on our Air Force, the Department of Defense, and our nation, um, the kind of impact it has is still yet to be determined. And 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 that every leader has an opportunity to help shape what that is. There are some things that we have learned through COVID that have been very positive. We've learned to be able to um, to to work through things a whole lot faster, and we've gotten able to cut a lot of the bureaucracy. And so to that point where we've learned that, you know what, we, we can actually get to an answer on something without going to these five or 10 people because it really doesn't take five or 10 people. For the things where we've learned how to go faster and move out and be more agile, we should never go back to the old ways because now we can do it in a better, smarter, more efficient and effective way. When it comes to the distance learning, and virtual stuff, we've also learned that we can actually interact virtually. And on some cases, it should, you know, being able to interact virtually um, is a game changer and it's a good thing. On some things, it's not. Um, I am a big fan of in-person professional military education. I'm a big fan of in-person connection points, looking at people eyeball to eyeball and, and, and seeing people connecting with people. For, for things like that, I think we've got to get back to um, in person. Yes, ma'am. I, I think the message at the Air Force Academy especially has been trying to look at this as an opportunity, which is hard, of course, with all the implications that COVID has, but really finding the ways that we could use this to our advantage. Um, so I'd like to transition again. And um, ma'am, a little personal question. When you're having a hard day or you're kind of it's Friday or it's, excuse me, it's Monday and you're not looking forward to the week exactly, what keeps you going? What motivates you to push through and really strive to be your best? Um, so Cadet Yates, when I'm having a bad day, I, I sometimes think about the Kansas City Chiefs and, and, and what a great group of um, athletes that is. No, I'm joking. Um, it's still a little fresh for me and I'm actually still heard about what happened a few weeks ago. But um, 
No, what, what honestly keeps me through the day um, is knowing that I, again, serve a, a, a greater calling and that there are a whole lot of people that are counting on me to be my best, to be on point, to um, advocate well for them and to carry our Air Force um, in the manner that, that, that I have the honor to serve. And so it's because of our airmen that I keep fighting the good fight. Man, that's great to hear. And I'm personally a Steelers fan, so I, I sympathize. We didn't make it quite as far as you guys anyway. Um, next season, though, that's why I keep telling myself. We're going to be um, good. Yes, ma'am. I hope so. Um, but we'll see. Um, so another uh, question to kind of follow up on that. Um, again, like if you're ever faced with um, dissent or maybe disrespect or kind of uh, airman or an officer or someone that's kind of being in a little bit of trouble that you think is a little off base, how do you react to that as a leader? And how do you not reprimand them per se, but motivate them to search another path and really learn from that mistake? You know, that's not necessarily um, a, a cut and dry answer um, to that effect. I think, I think it depends on who that individual is um, to you and the matter of influence that you have with that person, if that is somebody that you work with quite a bit and you, and you have a relationship where that airman um, and you understand each other, um, you're able to talk in different ways. And so it, um, it, it, that can be tough um, to answer on how we handle that. I think the important thing instead is that we still must handle it. You know, again, being in the profession of arms, um, we have standards that are higher than any other profession that we serve in. We have values that are expected of every single person who wears this uniform. Um, and and not, every, not every company or industry has the same values that we have. And so we, ha you know, there, there are... Um, there are certain um, customs and courtesies and, and, um, and ways that we've got to be able to operate. And we have to hold each other accountable to that. And, and that's from the smaller things and, and especially the smaller things all the way up to the bigger things. And, and again, how we handle that, I think we've got to get better as a service and being able to address those things with tact and with respect um, be, be able to, um, do it in, in a way that we're doing it because we care. So if we address the, any, you know, um, discrepancies or, or whatever it might be, we've got to do it because we come from a place of we care and it matters to, um, our service and we can't tolerate anything less than what, what, um, you know, our, our values and, and who we're supposed to be. Yes, ma'am. And I think that goes perfectly with our core values and excellence in all we do. And one of the questions we got is outside of the core values, uh, what is another value you believe to be equally as important? And then has that changed from when you were a uh, junior NCO to now a senior NCO or a chief master sergeant in the Air Force? Yeah. So it, as I mentioned with Senior Garcia, um, I didn't really join the Air Force till I was in eight years. So I, I, I don't want anybody to get out of this, like, you know, man, you know, the chief master of the Air Force is like really ate up and, and it's, and it's all about the values. I didn't, I didn't fully embrace our core values it, until I joined the Air Force at about eight years in, um, because values for me was a little bit different, right? You know, um, integrity to some people is, is maybe not snitching on your friend. And so what I had to learn was how do I make sure and I align my values up with what the Air Force expects for me to have um, integrity, service and excellence. But but the other value that I would offer that is extremely important to me and should be extremely important to every single one of us is the value of respect. And to me, that is foundational to who we are. If we are truly brothers and sisters in arms, we can, that can't just be a buzzword. We have to be able to respect each other as such. And if we respect each other as, as brothers and sisters in arms, then the 
um, disrespect will go down, the bullying will go away, the sexual harassment or assaults or workplace violence, all of that will, will, will go away. And so I can't emphasize enough the respect piece. And, and where I think we have some opportunity to grow is that for the most part, we understand, hey, on duty, respect, you know, um, but, but it really should be respect is on duty or off duty, in uniform, out of uniform, um, offline, and especially online. And, and, and I don't know that we've talked enough about the online piece, especially now that we're in an um, digital era in an information age, we have got to, as leaders, start to um, talk and, and dialogue and share with our, our teammates that, that that respect piece, again, it, it is especially online. Yes, ma'am. And we actually got a question kind of relating to that and love to get your insight. And they said, um, Chief asked, with regard to the acceleration or accelerating adoption of the cyber domain for use in communication, it's become apparent that people can spread, especially anonymously, subpar posts and negative mindsets. And how can leaders professionally combat this to ensure good order and discipline? That's a fantastic question. I would say we've got to hold the line and, and hold each other accountable. And don't let um, misinformation or disinformation sway you from what you know is right. Um, I have a pretty active social media presence and, and I choose to do so because it's part of our strategic messaging um, strategy. And, and the reason why I actually, um, you know, appreciate social media for, for a couple things. One, it's not gonna go anywhere. Like social media is there to stay um, and we can choose to either use it or we can avoid it. But if we avoid it, somebody else will fill that void to a message appropriately to, to your airmen, to your um, teammates, to your family members, whatever it is. And so it's not going to go away. And so um, for me and my team, we choose to use it as an opportunity to be able to flatten communication and to spread our message and, and share where we're going. We use it as a way to be able to listen and hear what's on the hearts and minds of our airmen. And man, it's a great opportunity to do so because we can do it at scale. Instead of just hearing from a few hundred people at an all call, um, we can hear from thousands of our airmen and, and be able to understand just, you know, kind of a data point of, of thoughts that they have. And, and again, sharing, sharing information. And so um, we, we, are very, um, we are very focused on sharing where our Air Force is going strategically. We're very focused on um, sharing the Air Force priorities, my, bro my boss's priorities, sharing our action orders, how we're going to get to the Air Force we need through action order A, B, C, and D, uh, focusing on the, the three areas that I'm focused on, people, readiness, and culture. And then my favorite part about um, why we, we particularly use social media is to highlight our heritage and to highlight our great airmen. And I mentioned before earlier, we have some of the most talented airmen serving in our Air Force. Um, I see it all the time because I get to, you know, talk to airmen from all different walks of life. I love to highlight that to the rest of the folks because, again, we, 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 our Air Force is, um, is the best Air Force in the world, not because of, you know, the weapon systems that are on the ramp. It's because of the weapon systems in each and every one of our people. We are the most competitive weapon system, um, and, and it's our people that make us that way. Thank you so much, ma'am, for that answer. Um, and then add another question from the audience. And as a junior NCO or a junior officer looking to pass feedback up the chain of command, how do you recommend going about that? I mean, what do you think is the best approach to providing respectful yet constructive feedback? I think emotional intelligence will go a long way and, and tact will go a long way in helping you learn how to best communicate to your leaders, but you have to communicate, like it, it's key. If you know a better way or a smarter way, or if you had feedback on how to make your organization better, 
to not share it um, would, would, would not be the ideal thing in, in my opinion. And I will tell you that I've had to learn from, I've had 28 years of learning and, and, I, and as I shared with Senior Garcia, failing forward to kind of learn my way and being able to provide that feedback. As a young senior airman, I remember um, Cadet Yates being told, um, you don't have the stripes on your sleeve yet, so just simmer down. And so I learned as a young senior airman, okay, so I can, you know, I, I need to be thoughtful in how I say things. And I actually had a chief tell me that when I was a senior airman, you can say anything that you want to say, you just need to learn how, how and when. And so I've taken that with me and I and, and applied that with some emotional intelligence and tact and learned that, um, you know, when should I say things? When will it be most received? And, and, and there's on occasion, sometimes you don't. But anyway, um, you know, again, learning emotional intelligence, sh learning how and when to say things to your leaders. Um, it, it, it's trial and error, but but you've got to do it. Thank you so much, ma'am. And it looks like we have time for one final question. And this is really for the seniors um, about to graduate and commission out there. So for the class of 2021, about to graduate, about to get those butter bars, what's one kind of lasting piece of advice you'd really want them to take away from this session or um, just taking into their very first unit? I, I'm going to provide three things if that's okay. Um, and, and the first one is never forget where you came from. So wh whatever beginnings you came from, never forget who you are, you, you know, the, the foundations and, and, and the characters uh, uh, and, and all the traits that helped you become who you are today. Um, never forget where you came from. That's going to be important to remember as you move forward as a leader, it will help you. Um, it will help others see you in a way where they, they see you as being authentically you and, and genuine. Um, two, never forget why you serve. So there's a why out there somewhere. Never forget why you serve. For me, as I mentioned to you, it's because of our airmen that I serve. And so that's what keeps me going. So when I'm dealing with those ad, um, adversities and, and when I'm dealing with those challenges, I fall back on my why. And, and I remember that we're playing the long game. And so I, I keep focused. And then three, I would offer never quit learning. Who you are today as a senior at the Air Force Academy pales in comparison to who you're going to be two years from now or even four years from now. I actually get excited talking to this generation of folks because in 20 years from now, you guys are the ones that are going to be leading our service at, at such a very critical time. And 20 years from now, you know, you are the future 06s and 07s that are going to be leading our force. Um, so never quit learning. Um, you're never too old to learn. Chief Bass, thank you so much again for your time today. We appreciate your willingness to share your unique background and experiences with us. You have enriched our view of warrior ethos and what it means to us as cadets and as future Air Force and Space Force officers. As a token of our appreciation, a commemorative plaque is on its way to you. We hope you remember your time with us as fondly as we will, and we hope to see you at, at the Air Force Academy as soon as COVID restrictions allow. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes this NCLS session. Thank you and have a great afternoon.